evening, welcome to To The Point. And today we have the lovely Dr. Laura Richardson, who's going to tell us all about male problems. <laughs> and since I'm one of those wretched males, I'm going to listen very carefully to what dear Dr. Laura has to say. Laura, what are you going to talk about Hello, today? Richard. Well, I'm hoping you can participate being a male yourself. And you've actually got an edge up because you're also a GP. So you're a male GP, and I'm sure you know quite a bit about male problems. As a female GP, I see a lot of men with male problems, but they're usually dragged in by their wives. and. Uh, after seeing me they might decide to go and see somebody else a male doctor if they've got one so today we're talking about common male problems things that men will necessarily be dragged in by their wives and the first image <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a, a competition in in australia in new south wales oh really <laughs> yes this is this is for real these are women dragging their husbands and it's a husband dragging competition <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's similar to what happens really Richard with men and their wives and then being dragged in to see the doctor uh, and I find that a lot of the time you have an exasperated wife saying I had to come in with him because he wouldn't come and see you on your own and so today hopefully we can talk about why well I want to ask you that straight away actually uh, Laura Tell me, in your opinion, it's quite true by the way, it's mm -hmm. absolutely true, I'm terrified of going to see the GP, even though I'm a doctor myself, I'm absolutely terrified of seeing the GP. Now why is it that men are frightened of going to see the doctor? Laura, why are men so frightened of seeing their doctor? Lots of things, and I was reading statistics and the reasons why, and some of the reasons are, for instance, they rationalise that the problem will just go away. Yeah. That whatever it is, it's just going to vanish into thin air and they don't need to see the doctor about it. Another thing is, they're too busy. And we see a lot of that. We see a lot of men who come in right at the end and we tend to have problems with late diagnosis of some very life-threatening illnesses mm. because a man's too busy. He's too busy earning, mm. you know, earning money, bringing yeah. home the bacon, as it were. Yeah. So yeah. T being too busy I is yeah. another one. Embarrassment is another one, uh, yeah. especially if it's a male problem in particular. People are just embarrassed, Richard, that uh, yeah. they, they don't want to be examined and it, it's very personal to them and they don't want to have this um, uh, you know, thing, situation dealt with. Another one is bad experiences in the past. You know, they might have had a bad experience with a doctor. A doctor was too tired, too rude, too in a hurry, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And or doctor um, poo pooed their condition and said, oh, that's nothing, why are you here, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So they become discouraged about actually going to see a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I said, denial is a key one. Being too busy is another one. Yeah. And, um, and what things do the wives not say? They don't nag. <laughs> 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 and what do they not do? They don't book appointments behind the husband's back and say, oh, you've got to see Dr. Richard Kent on Tuesday at nine o'clock. And it's like, hello, where did that come from? And um, wives, you have to cooperate with your husband and you have to get into, mm. obviously, if you're worried about him, get to the point where you know that something needs to be done and try and encourage them to make this appointment to see mm. the doctor. So don't nag them, don't make an appointment behind their back and just say, don't threaten, don't manipulate, don't threaten, you're gonna walk out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the rest of those things. Um, and uh, you know, help, if, you, if, you, if, if your wife and your husband's got a condition that you're worried about, share your concerns with, um, with your husband. Let him know that you're concerned that he has something that it could be life-threatening. You don't wanna be a widow, you know, you don't want to, and yeah. all those sorts of things. At least, yeah. you know, you're afraid of losing him and the kids and the grandkids and what have yeah, you yeah. so um no, it's quite true what you say can i just uh, just say it's terribly important that uh, men in particular but all um, adults and children but i'm talking about adults really take responsibility for their own health um i'm thinking right now of somebody i i He's not a close friend, but somebody I know, who had a massive stroke, and he hadn't been to a doctor for 30 years, and his blood pressure was absolutely sky high. So now he's in a wheelchair, he's lucky to survive, but the point is, if he'd seen a GP and they found out he got very bad hypertension, then his blood pressure would be controlled and he probably wouldn't have had a stroke. And I was thinking of another patient, actually, uh, somebody else I know quite well, uh, she suddenly started fitting, as a lady in this occasion, and she hadn't seen a doctor for 20 years and her blood pressure was sky high. But it, it covers di um, diabetes, it covers high blood pressure, it covers all sorts of things, doesn't it, Laura? But yeah. people need to take responsibility for themselves. I totally agree. And, <laughs> and that's one thing I try to tell patients when they come in to see me. I'll see Mr. Mr. John Smith and say, oh, Mr. Smith, gosh, you know, we're now in 2000 and say 2016, and 
Oh, the last time you came in was 2010. That's, that's a long time, especially now you're over 40. Um, can I just encourage you? I'd like you to, to see you every couple of years. Just come in, have your blood pressure checked, mm. have basic blood tests done, like your cholesterol. Know what your cholesterol is, know what your blood sugar is. Yeah. Simple things like that. I mean, obviously, as women have more screening, cancer screening tests like cervical cancer, breast cancer, etc. Yeah. And we don't so much men, and we'll be talking about that later. Yeah. But I would really encourage you that, you know, 40 is a good age to start to see, to make sure that you are preventing anything that could possibly happen. So for instance, we'll be talking about prostate cancer, we'll be talking about testicular cancer in a minute. The things that start to happen, start to happen, and the problem is if they're picked up early, like your friend mm. who had a stroke, yeah. if he had been having his, he or she had been having the blood pressure checked yeah. every couple of years, yeah then it would have been discovered along the line that suddenly the blood pressure was 120 over 70 and now it's 160 over 100. You know, that yeah. would have been noticed yeah. over a period of time. It was much harder than that, actually, but anyway. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly, I'm sure. Yeah. So, so things like, you know, blood pressure checks, cholesterol checks, blood sugar checks are good to do on a regular, on every couple of years. If they're normal, you don't have to do it every year. Yeah. But if, if somebody's got, say, diagnosed high blood pressure or diabetes, then the test should be done yearly. You should yeah. come in once a year to have your kidney function and all yeah, the other tests. Yeah. So, so yeah, so wives, um, that husband dragging thing was, <laughs> was a bit of a joke, but actually it is reality. And I'm sure when you were practicing as well, you must have had experiences like that where women did come in too. Absolutely. Did, did your wife ever have to drag you in, Richard? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, I'm actually a bit neurotic. I take my own blood pressure once a month and do my blood sugar once a month. I, I, just on my own, because I think it's so important. Do you know, Richard, I don't think that's neurotic at all. I really, really don't. Yeah. I think it's part of, it should be part of just normal, everyday self-care. Yeah. You know, we weekly, monthly self-care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got yeah. an app on my, on my phone as well, and I, you know, check my weight, check my blood. I do that too, you know, once a month. And, you yeah. know, with yeah. us women, just pick a time of the month that suits you, which is the time of the month, yeah. and just decide to do it all then. And, and you yeah. know, I just do that. Yeah. And I think it's actually yeah. good. I don't think it's, it's neurotic at all. Yeah. I think we need to, we're very fortunate that in the, in, we have the NHS in the UK. Yeah. I think if, if a lot of us, um, just took that extra bit of self-care, self-awareness. Yeah. We will pick things up sooner, go to the doctor when we need to go and see them. Yeah. And we'll also be aware, oh, I need to change my diet a little bit, too much salt, too much of these, exercise a bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, yeah. I, I think it's fantastic. Wonderful. Hope you'll listen to Dr. Laura. Wisdom coming from Dr. Laura now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so common male problems. Yes. Common male problems. We're going to start with one that it's not common in terms of statistics in the sense that only about 1% of the UK population have this particular condition, but it is common in young men and that's testic testicular cancer. And that's an image of a, uh, on the right, on the left you've got a healthy t uh, testicle and on the right there you've got uh, a tumour, uh, a couple of tumours actually in the testes. Now the thing about testicular cancer is that it is not that common in, of a cancer but as I said, between the ages of 15 and 40, this is one of the commonest cancers. Right. So, I need to think about it is the two things that it's easily detectable. Just as we encourage women to examine their breasts, I encourage all men from the age of 15. So once you hit puberty, really, or you know, start to so develop a second sexual characteristics, till about the age of 40, to regularly check your testicles. And the best time to do it is in the shower. So, you know, there are lots of YouTube, um, you know, Google YouTube, there are lots of um, clips on how to examine your, your testicles, and th this is not the place to do it, but it's so important. So testicular cancer, it's common in the young men between the ages of 15 and 40. It peaks in about the early 30s. Um, it was actually brought to my mind only in the last week because I saw a young man who was in his late 20s who had testicular cancer successfully. The, they had what they call an ochidectomy, which is a removal of the testicle, and he's doing very well. Yeah. That's a hydrocele, which we'll come to next. <laughs> but they, <laughs> 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 but um, but this, this, guy, this guy is doing really, really well, but yeah. it just goes to show that 28, and he's only 28 and he's got mm. testicular cancer. Yeah. Um, very briefly, what causes and what are the risk factors for testic testicular cancer? One of the main risk factors actually, in about 26% of people who have testicular cancer, is failure of the testicles to descend. Oh into the scrotum so during the development period in a baby um, the embryo as we all were at one point in our mother's wombs um, at about five weeks 
begins the differentiation of the, the, the sex organs at about yeah. five weeks. Yeah. And it completes by dissension, descending off the testicles from the abdomen into the scrotum where the temperature is lower. And this happens at about 32 weeks right. in, the, in, the, in the baby. Right. So the, before the baby is born, the, the testicles would have descended. Um, premature male males will find that the testicles have not descended and they have to do things about it. But undescended testicles is one of the risk factors of uh, testicular cancer. Um, and so it's important that, you know, when the baby's born, the testicles are checked. Um, even if the testicles are corrected, we have the, uh, a surgical procedure called ocytopexy, where they actually bring the testicles down and sew them down into, right. into the area, they can still have that risk. Another risk is uh, family history um, of, of, of testicular cancer. So check your, check your testicles, young men particularly, this is important. What does a, a cancer of the testicle look like? Well, people complain of a painless hard lump. So it's important to know what your testicles are like normally so that you know where there's a change. And if there's any change, it could be painful, it could be uh, painless. If there is a lump that you feel or there's a swelling in your testicle, there's a dragging sensation, go and see your GP. Mm. Excellent. Very good advice. <laughs> So the next condition is the hydrocele, and, and that was that wonderful diagram there of a hydrocele being removed in, in, uh, on, in the operating theatre. That is a fluid-filled sac, and that is massive. I mean, that's about the size of a baby's head, that, that hydrocele, <laughs> isn't it? In fact, you know, if you looked quickly at it, you'd think that was a caesarean section, wouldn't you? You would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that is a hydrocele removal, and hydrocels are fluid-filled sacs. They're formed again in the, in the scrotum, they are due to either excessive production of the fluid around the testicles or something that's blocking the drainage of the fluid. Um, and that's really what I want to say about a, a hydrocele. I don't want to spend too much about it. It's obvious if a man's got a hydrocele, there's this big swelling in and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When they're a certain size, they may go down, but that is obvious that there is a, there's a big swelling there. It's filled with fluid. It usually needs to be drained, but if it keeps recurring and filling up again, then the best thing is actually to remove the hydrocele, and it, it is in a sac which can be removed. So yeah. that's something else. And again, because it's in that part of the body, men may be reluctant to coming to be, to be seen. Yeah. But I would really encourage you to please, gentlemen, come in to see the doctor. Uh, when, we, when we examine a patient, normally, remember the torchlight um, yes, yes, <laughs> um, transillumination? Yeah. I remember as a medical student, get my torchlight out and, you know, around this bed of this poor patient who'd come in to have an, um, his hydrocele drained and we'll all be shining a torch <laughs> to get the transillumination, which is just um, light shining through the... Um, it's great. Through the scrotum. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's hydrocele's. Um, so the next one is um, hernia. Yes. And Richard. Yes. Can I talk to you about hernias a little bit? Or you rather, can, can you talk I've to me? I've had them. Can you talk to us about hernias? Well, I had a chat uh, before we started this programme, and I understand from Laura that 20% of um, men uh, have to have hernia operations. Is that right? Look, yes, that's yeah, right, well, yeah. I was one of them. <laughs> um, and basically, you just uh, you find a lump in your groin, and Laura will be telling us in a moment what causes it. Uh, it's an, not a um, huge operation. Um, I actually had to have three of them, believe it or not. Uh, it's my fault entirely because. Uh, are they bilateral? In other words, they're on both sides. In, in my case, I had to. I had a, a, lapar a laparoscopy, and they and they did it internally. Uh, Laura, you remind me of all the right words. But anyway, I went back to the gym too quickly because I was ready to keep fit by then. And unfortunately, I went I rushed back to the gym too early, and they both came back. So I had to have two separate open inguinal hernia repairs, and uh, basically. Um, it's not a big deal, actually. It's just that it, you have to behave yourself and not go rushing back to running or serious uh, exercise for probably four to six weeks so that everyone can, everyone can knit up properly 
unlike I did the first time. <laughs> that, and that's absolutely right. I mean, actually, if you think about the reverse of that, what causes hernias, you actually found that out the hard way. Yeah. That, and it, it's really, it's common. I think we've got an image there, um, image four, of different types of hernias. And the ones that you had, of course, were the inguinal hernias, which you'll find on the diagram on the left there, which is a indirect. But you see the different types of hernias. There's the epigastric, inguinal, umbilical, uh, and femoral hernias, and incisional hernias. Yeah. And basically, they are caused by protrusion, usually of part of the gut, yep. into, from the abdomen, into this hole, this, this weakness yes. in the abdominal wall. Yes. And in men, the inguinal hernias are common because obviously when the testes are descending in the, in the process of reproduction, there can be a weakness there. But it's commonly found in men, active men, so usually men between the ages of, say, about 30, 30 something to 70 something, yeah. really, I would say, yeah. when, I, when yeah. I think about it. And you sort of fit into that age category, more 40, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but they, they commonly happen in young men. They are they happen in women as well, but mainly in men. And they, a lot of the time is due to either some sort of weakness from a job they do, a job that involves heavy lifting. So people who do a lot of heavy lifting, whether it's uh, delivering um, you know goods from you know mm. superstores or, or um, gardening jobs landscape gardeners yeah. builders bricklayers yeah. and people like that anything that involves tree surgeons anything that involves even people who just go to the gym like you Richard you yeah. know who are mm. trying to stay fit and keep healthy yeah. so it's important that you do look after you and you, you know you carry things properly you bend at the knees you yeah. don't lift mm. it all with your back and your your abdominal muscles important to keep the core muscles very you know fit as well and a stitch in time saves nine mm -hmm. i actually had a wonderful lovely young uh, not yet so young i call him young but he's actually over 80 and he came <laughs> in to see me recently and he had a whopper of an inguinal hernia serious right. whopper it was it was about the size of the hydrocell actually right. um thankfully i was able to reduce it and i just gently sort of fed everything back into this hole that it all came out and just try to hold it down yeah. and then what I did was um, got because he, he can't have an operation because of his health yeah. thankfully he can have a you don't have to have it under general anymore you can have it lapar laparoscopically which is yeah. great yeah. Um, but even that would be a challenge for him so I've given him a truss yeah. And uh, do you remember the trusses? <laughs> Certainly do, yes. <laughs> no, all about trusses, I'm afraid. <laughs> and it's basically like a sling, isn't yes. it? With a little yeah. padded yeah. Um, thing, Put cushion. Put it all together. <laughs> yeah. In fact, when he came in to see me, he had the cushion that his daughter had given him from her wedding ring, you know, the, the cushions that they yeah. carry the wedding rings on, and she'd given it to her dad as a gift. Oh, right. And she, he brought in... <laughs> <laughs> It's quite funny, really. <laughs> yeah. So there was this wedding ring cushion right. with his bells on this on this thing, and I had to say oh, to Mister So and So, "Okay, yeah. I think we'll get you a truss. So yeah. let's let's order one." So I did a prescription for him, and so you yeah. take it to the pharmacist, and they can order one for you. <laughs> but yes, but the, you know, they, they can be. I mean, you know, we're, we're laughing about it, but those are reducible hernias. Yeah. They can become irreducible and incarcerated, can't they? They it's can. Or exsanguinated, and then they become dangerous because the blood supply to the area gets strangulated, and that could be almost an, that could be an emergency situation. So don't let it get to that stage. A stitch in time really does uh, save nine. Yes. So that's hernia sorted out. Um, but now we're coming to a couple of um, conditions in men that are very, very serious, and I see a lot of them, and they are important for two reasons. The first one is prostate cancer. Right. And the reason this is important and um, is because we have um, a controversy around the PSA test. Certainly do. We yeah. do. Yeah. Um, in fact, the, the UK National Screening Committee recommends that men do not have regular PSA tests. Right. And the reason they do that, and PSA, by the way, stands for uh, prostate-specific antigen, which is a protein that's produced by the prostate gland um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's produced naturally and it has lots of uses. It helps to break down seminal fluid and all sorts of things. But this particular uh, enzyme is also raised not just in prostate cancer but in other conditions like just benign prostate enlargement which happens to lots of men and that's a diagram of an enlarged prostate gland. And now that, that prostate gland is not meant to be cancerous 
but it can cause symptoms. And what do men have? They have frequency, going to the toilet more frequently. Sometimes a man will c complain that they go into the toilet five or six times at night, mm. which of course is, is really not acceptable. You know, it disrupts sleeps and, and, and all the rest of it. So men will complain of, of frequency. They will complain of w having what they call hesitancy, which means that when they want to go, they have to wait a little bit before the flow of urine comes. And then what they might do is they have, they have dribbling at the end of the stream, they may find that they've just they've gone and they thought they were, they'd finished and then a little bit more urine comes or they, they might find that they're going backwards and forwards because there's incomplete emptying, there's pressure on the bladder area all the time and those sorts of symptoms can occur with just a benign prostatic hypertrophy, nothing to do with cancer at all and in fact the, it's most likely that if a man's got symptoms of BPH, yep. you know, it's just BPH rather than prostate cancer. Right. And the reason is that by the time prostate cancer is advanced enough to have symptoms, the symptoms are, are, are you know, it's, it's quite, quite advanced. Right. So the UK NSC um, does not encourage PSA testing. The PSA test, even though prostate cancer, I mean, it is now in, in terms of um, cancers, it is actually the second largest cancer cause in men mm. in the UK, lung cancer being the first one. So it is very important. And there's 21% um, deaths from prostate cancer. So it's very important. But we just have to unravel this whole thing about when to do a PSA and whether it is indicative of cancer or not. Right. So if somebody, if a man's got symptoms, of BPH, frequency, dribbling, incomplete emptying, pressure, that sort of thing. It's always a good idea to go and see your doctor, and this is an area where some men will not go and see the doctors, and their wives will have to, to bring them in. So go and see your GP, get PSA tests if you've got symptoms. Prostate cancer affects people over the age of, usually from the age of 40. Um, it, it starts to peak in about the age of, si in the late 60s, early 70s. That's when you see majority, about 44% of prostate cancers would happen in that sort of age group in the 60s, 70s age group. The thing is, the PSA test is not specific. So there are about 60% of PSA, t rise in PSAs that are just false negatives. Right. And that's why it's not recommended, because it panics a lot of people. They think, I've got a raised PSA, therefore I've got cancer. Well, it's actually not true, actually. Yeah. So a raised PSA doesn't mean you've got prostate cancer. It could just mean you've got BPH. Um, likewise, um, it's important to do your checks. If you've got symptoms, you've got family history, do get a PSA test. So it's not that you shouldn't, but it's not to be used as a screen. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, uh, any, anything you want to add to that or...? or um, no, I think you've yeah. covered it very well. It's just, it is, there is a bit of controversy about it, actually. Yeah, but uh, that's... Laura, there's only five minutes left. Okay. I'd love you to cover stress. Absolutely. Men. men coming with this. In fact, their wives bring them with this. Yeah. And this is something they weren't coming with. Yeah. Stress. Yeah. They complain of feeling low. They complain of not sleeping properly, poor concentration, traits of depression, or just feeling tired all the time. We do all their blood tests, and the blood tests are normal. Yeah. Stress. You've had stress in your life. Oh, yeah, I have, yes. I don't mind talking about it, actually. Mm. Uh, uh, well, I had a, a very nasty road traffic accident um, about eight years ago now. And I had post-traumatic stress disorder, which meant up I woke up, woke up in the night sort of uh, in, with nightmares and I was shivering and I was really frightened because I was reliving the accident and all that. I was nearly killed. But anyway, the details of the accident don't matter. The point was dealing with the stress because I got really, really uptight. And for example, if a loud noise would make me jump and uh, a telephone would make me jump. Or if anybody spoke loudly, I would jump. And I was getting very, very jumpy. Um, and so I went to see my GP who completely understood and put me on some um, sedatives called Valium or Diazepam, quite well known. But actually they made me sleepy, but they didn't really deal with the stress. So from a Christian, this is how I dealt with the stress. And I'd be interested to hear what dear Dr. Laura has to say about it. Uh, there are two aspects of it. One is spiritual, the other is physical. Right, well, the first of all, the physical aspect of it. I found exercise, uh, we all know it releases natural endorphins, uh, which actually uh, sedate anxiety better than diazepam, actually. Uh, also, if you have an associated depression, that tends to elevate your mood as well. So exercise is really important. Uh, but actually, from the more spiritual aspect, um, I actually found that listening to worship music 
Uh, I prefer Hillsong, but I mean, every, everyone likes their own thing. And also listen to scripture. I think all Christians should have, uh, have either CDs or whatever of worship music and the Bible, preferably in their car, on their phone, whatever it suits you. But I find that absolutely invaluable because it puts things in proportion. I was just recently studying the book of Revelation. And when, it, when you compare the importance of heaven and hell with the difficulties with getting over a car accident or troubles with your bank account or whatever it is, all our problems are put in perspective. I've spoken enough, Laura. What do you think? That's absolutely right. And, and of course, when, when they, the men do come in, they will have money worries, they would have relationship worries, they would have you know, things about their, their self-esteem worries, or even things that have happened to them in their childhood that are being brought forward perhaps because they just had a child. And suddenly, they've been, you know, things that happened in childhood comes to light and they have anger management issues and things like that. And again, as, as I said, stress is so important with men. So I would say to them, yes, absolutely, especially as Christians watching, I would recommend, I mean, and obviously not all my patients are Christians. Um, so, you know, on, on a basic, I would say physically, exercise, very important. Look at your diet. We didn't have time to talk about prostate diet, but things like, things to help with the prostate, Pumpkin seeds, saw palmetto, pomegranates are very good, lycopene, tomatoes are good as well. You know, taking um, and selenium nuts are also good for prostate health. So men, get those in your diet, in your shopping trolley. But so I would recommend exercise being a good way of relieving stress. If there were Christians, absolutely, prayer, meditation on the word of God, worship, yeah. the presence of God, yeah. the people of God, praising him. Wow, mm. what that does, it totally lifts. Um, as, a, as a stress reliever, I would recommend counselling for them as well. I would give them information about counselling. I'd refer them for counselling. I'd recommend self-help books as well. There are lots of books yeah. you can help, like personality books about personalities and why they react the way they do, and those sorts of things. Um, I think we might need to do a, a second part to common male problems. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of them, aren't there, Laura? <laughs> There was one slide at the end, which was the happy bunny slide, where you've got the happy doctor, the happy husband, and the happy wife. I don't know if we got time to show that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's hopefully the end result of wives dragging in or persuading their... Oh, there you go. Persuading their, their husbands to come in to see the doctor. Hopefully these issues we talked about will be resolved and resolved quickly. Well, we've just got one minute left. So... Um, Advice to men and advice for their wives or partners, whatever. How do we get the men into the, into the surgeries? Wives, encourage them to come in. Don't nag them. Encourage them. Let them know about your concerns about their health. And just let them know that a healthy, happy husband is a healthy, happy wife and children. Very important because... You know, you know what we women are like, men. So. Well, thank you for joining us, and thank you especially to Dr. Laura for giving us up-to-date information about men's problems. Now, we'd love to hear from you. Actually, we don't hear from you enough. We'd love to hear from you at info at revelationtv.com. So please write to us. We'd love to know what you, programs you'd like us to cover, and see you next Monday to the point. Thanks for joining us, and God bless you.